co-founder of an organization called PL Tech. As Katie said earlier, I'm actually based in Aberdeenshire, so north of Aberdeen. And we are passionate about helping people to adopt new technologies. When our business started, and even today, actually, a lot of the work that we do is putting tech in people's houses. Um, our visit, biggest customer is actually a housing association, so we do all of their tech support. Um, and this kind of this story, this kind space story that I'm going to tell you, uh, kicked off mid pandemic when we couldn't go to people's houses. So at that time, the housing association basically closed their doors, said no one's going to any of the tenants' houses. We couldn't really visit any of our individual customers either. Um, and so what we started doing initially was creating uh, tutorials to teach people how to use the Alexa smart speakers to video call their loved ones to stay in touch. And then that followed on into us discovering that you can build apps for voice assistants, which is a really exciting space to be in. So we created Kind Space um, and we've now been on a bit of a journey in looking at how it can help mental health and well-being and working with Marion and an organisation called IT for Anxiety to look at what benefits are and kind of quantifying the kind of clinical evidence base behind Kindspace. So I'll tell you a little bit more about Kindspace and how it works. If I can get the slides to move on, there we go. Um, so Kindspace has three parts to how it works. It's all focused around well-being and it encourages people to check in every day. We have a big library of tips and advice. And then the newest part to what Kindspace does is interactive wellness activities. So it's audio based activities that you can um, participate in. So things like journaling prompts, breathing exercises, and our newest collection is um, bedtime stories for grown ups, which is a really beautiful collaboration with a, an award winning author, which we're really excited about. Um, so yeah, so Kindspace I guess is blending a little bit of the digital and the analog world. So with a lot of the activities, you know, we're encouraging people to write in their journal or they're doing a breathing exercise, which is a bit more immersive. Um, so it's a little bit different from your smartphone applications. And we like it because it's kind of distraction free. I don't know if anyone else is like me. As soon as I take my phone out of my pocket, I'm like, why does it take my phone out of my pocket? Because all of the notifications just distract me and it can be quite stressful. I think technology can be quite stressful for people. So Kindspace offers a wee bit of an escape from the normal tech world. So I'll tell you a little bit about some of the research that we've done this year, supported by IT for Anxiety. Um, we, we worked with IT for Anxiety to kind of devised the program of how we were going to go about the research and what aspect would we look at so what aspect of well-being would we investigate and we chose to look at feelings of worry and this is just our timeline of, of how we went about doing that essentially we did a six-week trial with a cohort of people where we looked at how worried they were at the beginning the middle at the end and then looked to see what trends there were in the data a lot of the data that we collected as well as measuring using this Penn State Worry Questionnaire was actually qualitative data. So understanding their feelings around using the technology as well, because we know that you know a lot of people are a bit apprehensive about voice assistants. So if I get into some of the results um, or some of the uh, context as well around who, who our participants were, we had 30 people from the UK and two people from the Netherlands. We had a, a fairly even-ish split between male and female, and 44% of our participants were caregivers. We also looked at how worried they were, like I say, at the beginning, the middle, and the end, and kind of tracked whether they got more worried or less worried. This is kind of a busy chart, but it does basically show you that more people improved than got worse. But also what I found, which was really, really interesting, and, and this chart shows it, is that people had a really high baseline of worry. So people were more worried, I think, than I had realized they would be when we measured that at the beginning. And actually the people with the highest levels of worry and probably more in the kind of anxiety sort of stage of worry, 
um, self-selected themselves out of the study. So they that validated for us something that we, we kind of already knew is that kind space isn't there for people with really um, problematic feelings around stress and worry and anxiety. It's more of a preventative tool than it is, uh, or like a maintenance tool than it is getting into treating someone who's got quite significant clinical symptoms. So that in itself was really an interesting observation. And then this gives you an overview of the different activities that people were participating in. We had 550 sessions in total. We asked people to do about three sessions a week. And typically people were using the app for about 15 minutes per session, roughly. Um, we had a fairly good number of people uh, continue on the study. So we started off with 63 and then we had 32 active participants at the end. And we also had eight of those participants help us with the online focus group where we were able to delve a bit more in detail around their experiences of using the app and the things that they liked and, and didn't like and, and how they felt at, at the end of it, whether it made a difference to them. Um, what you can kind of see in this chart is that for most of the activities, you know, there's a fairly um, consistent usage. The one that I might point out is the, the short story. So you see a kind of a bit of a drop off there. And that was because at the time of the trial, we only had one story from the writer, um, which we had a, as a, in itself a trial. So we were you know, exploring our short stories, the kind of content that we want to include in the app. But we've now since um, published a, a full library of 10 stories. So without that variety, you know, a lot of people were like, I've listened to the story, I don't want to listen to it again. Whereas the other activities, there, there's a more varied range of choices for them and the other, the other options. Um, so yeah, so that was our participation. And then the really exciting bit is what happened over time to people's feelings of worry. So for me, this has been really exciting to see. So 84% of our participants experienced a significant reduction in their feelings of worry. Uh, the chart again is a little bit busy, but you can see like for a lot of people, there was slight improvement and actually there's been a significant improvement for, for many of the participants. So it's really interesting to be able to overlay that with the qualitative feedback and some really interesting um, observations that we've been able to gather through the research. We also looked at the system usability. So we used a standard 10 question um, uh, approach uh, to kind of benchmark the app and understand in general, is it an acceptable solution? Do people find it intuitive and easy to use? And we got a really good score there, which was fantastic. Um, not to say that there, there weren't things that we wanted to improve on and still want to improve on, but I think, again, it was a really nice thing to be able to, uh, to see and to understand that what we're building is actually making a difference and people like it. So here's some feedback from some of our participants. Um, we've got so much rich feedback. I think that's been one of the biggest advantages of, of this whole process. Um, and interesting to see people's change in attitude. So one quote that's not up there um, is, is one, one participant and said they were really skeptical about being a part of this and trying it. And then they, they realized that actually some of the activities and you know the simple things of the breathing exercises and the journaling every day were actually making a difference to them. And they were really glad that they had actually participated. So that was lovely to hear. And then kind of summing up, um, as I said, like looking at the worry side of things was our primary objective, but we actually gathered a lot of insights outside of that. We, we asked some questions around people's usage of smart speakers and their understanding of the technology, like what do they typically use it for day to day and what kinds of devices that they have. And that was really interesting. So most people mainly only know that it can do music and simple timers. They didn't actually realize that apps existed. 
So for many of them, it was the first time that they had knowingly used a, a third party application. Um, I think most people just assume that Amazon builds everything. So, so that was interesting. I think that helped the participants as well to like increase their confidence with exploring what's available on their smart speakers. Um, most of them actually only had access to a basic smart speaker with the audio only, rather than the, you get ranges of devices that have screens that give you a bit more um, real estate when it comes to how you can interact with, with a person. Um, and we asked about some of their thoughts around well-being in general. Um, like who do they turn to? What tools do they turn to? And overwhelmingly people talked about turning to family and friends and, and doing that in preference to before they see a doctor or before they consult Google, they, they would ask a family or a friend. Um, we also asked them about how they felt about using the technology, so some of the concerns. Uh, we we hear, hear this in our business anyway, so a lot of our customers, they, they do feel a bit apprehensive about having something like a voice assistant in their home because they think, oh, it's always listening. Um, they worry about what Amazon might be doing with the data. Is it there because Amazon wants to sell you more stuff? And then there's the kind of usual frustrations, especially for someone with a Scottish accent, not necessarily always being understood correctly, or there being um, errors in the system and, and it being a bit more of a clunky experience where you're not getting to the bit that you, you want to because it keeps mishearing um, or not understanding your commands. Um, but all really, really rich feedback for us. And it's helped us to look at what improvements that we want to make. So looking at the audio quality, bedtime stories, which we've just released the, the full um, library. Uh, the journaling prompts by far were the most popular feature and the one that people in the qualitative feedback talked about the most in terms of how, how beneficial it was. So we're working on some new um, journaling prompts and some new ideas about how we might be able to make that even more personalized and interactive. Um, and then the guided affirmations, most people felt it was too long and that they would rather have a slightly shorter session for the affirmation. So we've already updated that as well. Um, but yeah, it's been a fantastic opportunity to be able to work on this research and work with Ulster University and also Marion at Western Isles. And um, if anyone's got any questions or they want to find out more about Kindspace, um, our website's createyourkindspace.com. My email is there if you want to get in touch. And if you fancy helping us on our mission to increase um, awareness around different digital solutions, looking at addressing loneliness and making health information accessible, anything voice technology related, we are more than happy to kind of share all of our lessons learned and you know, some of the hurdles when it comes to navigating the Amazon ecosystem. Um, yeah, so thank you. Wonderful presentation there. That was really interesting, Carolyn. Uh, do we have some questions for Carolyn, please, from the audience? Can I ask about journaling? I didn't understand what kind of prompt you got for journaling. Yeah, so um, at the moment we have a morning version and an evening version. And the morning version helps to guide you through uh, like setting your intentions for the day, basically. And the way the prompts work is it's audio that you listen to and then you either write, we have printable resources that you can go to our website and download. Um, or you can equally just use a favourite notebook or your own journal that you maybe already have. So it's guiding you through that process, but you're physically writing. So there, there's really good evidence that shows that tactile experience of writing is really beneficial. Um, so that, that's how it works. And then in the evening, it's a little bit more reflective. Our signature thing is that we, we always weave in some kindness. So in the morning, we, we say, what will you do to be kind today? And remind people that that kindness can be a kindness to yourself. Um, and actually, we encourage people 
<laughs> to make sure that they're making yeah they're making themselves a priority um and then in the evening it's a similar thing but instead it's like what did you do to be kind today and kind of reflecting on that um and then the new journaling prompts are super exciting so we're going to make a magic ai journal that is much more dynamic um rather than just having the two options of you can do the morning one or you can do the evening one it will be much more dynamic which is really exciting thank you and i i think the evidence um there was a bbc radio 4 a podcast about uh, just one thing and it was about journaling and that's the evidence there yes it was really interesting thank you yeah. and what a wonderful opportunity caroline um can, can you say how has it impacted you personally and professionally uh that's such a good question i didn't know what we were building when we started honestly we we've been on like there's a bit of a whirlwind journey and that like at the start of 2020 if someone had said to me before the year is out you will have an app in the amazon marketplace i would have been like you're bonkers like what <laughs> doesn't even make any sense and then even when we started to build kind space like our whole rationale was thinking about our customers and thinking about the people at the housing association and how isolated and alone and and anxious they would be feeling and we wanted to build something that would help in that situation and then we were obviously all going through those sorts of feelings with lockdown and working from home and <laughs> trying to school the children and i started to realize more and more how helpful kind space was to, to lots of different types of people um, and actually how much of myself and my own lived experiences that are, that are in kind space now and everyone that I meet, I, I love to ask them like, you know, what's your go to thing? Like, what's the thing that helps you when you're just feeling like icky, like you're just not yourself? What what do you go to? What do you gravitate to? And, and that's all baked in there. So I've met so many amazing people on this journey who have shared all that wisdom. And I'm, re I'm really excited actually to see, you know, how it will grow and like, yeah, it's it's been a really personal journey as well. Amazing, absolutely amazing, and uh, one of these things in life you just don't see coming at all, uh, which we've all experienced <laughs> lately. Uh, but a very very positive. Nice, nice to see the positives coming out of it as well, and it, I, I get the impression you're making a real difference, and that I must hope be so. And I think yeah. that's the thing with the research when the results came back it did make me feel quite emotional because I didn't I didn't know if it worked or not you know I had this this huge imposter syndrome of I if I made you know the classic tech mistake you know you see all the you know the entrepreneurial stories of you've built something that no one wants and no one actually values um and I was like man what if we've done all this for for nothing but actually there's yeah some really beautiful pieces of feedback that we've received and like the one that I said you know about someone who said I was really skeptical I didn't even want to be a uh -huh. part of this but I thought I'd give it a go and now I'm really glad that I did so yeah it's um... oh amazing absolutely amazing I we're going to give people a chance to ask questions later on as well but Carolyn for now thank you very very much beautiful presentation lovely slides but very powerful story front and foremost and so absolutely delighted we're going to go next to Marion's presentation and Marion is over in the Western Isles and is having one or two technical problems um she is with us uh, and uh, here she is and I'm going to share slides so uh, Marion once I get the slides up and going I'll um, over to you and you can tell me when you want me to change them Thanks, Katie. And thanks for the invitation. And sorry about the technical difficulties, just typical, um, but um, not sure what's going on. It's not our connection. We've got a very good connection in the store anyway, actually. So uh, just gremlins in the laptop, I think, today. Um, I, you're sharing the screen for uh, the slides for me, are you? Um, can, can people see them? Not as yet. Oh, right. Let's That's come okay. up. 
Try again. I'll just introduce myself when you're doing that. Yeah. Um, my name is Marion McInnes and I'm a project manager in the research and innovation services team at NHS Western Isles. And I've been in that post for about 18 months now. And I was um, taken on the role to specifically work with two projects, which I'm going to speak a little bit about today. Just give a quick overview and they're both interreg funded projects so um, unfortunately that's coming to an end in September and um, it's been very interesting and um, one of the projects is already finished the other project is finishing off uh, at the um, so that's just yeah that's them up now again? Katie I think yeah. okay yeah you can move on to the next one that's great thanks So I'm going to speak about three main projects today, the Chatpal project, the IT for Anxiety project, and another project was a kind of side project, just with some funding that had been left over from another project that had been taking part in NHS Western Isles, which was funded through Empower, um, where we looked at some online digital arts therapy research with UHI. Uh, next slide, please, Katie. So the Chatpal project um, was a three-year project and it ran um, up until September last year. It finished in September last year. And the aim was to undertake pilot trials in five NPA regions. So there was Sweden, that's Northern Periphery Arctic regions. And there was Sweden, Finland, Northern Ireland, ourselves in Scotland, NHS Western Isles with a Scottish partner, and Ireland. And the aim was to increase citizen access to psychotherapeutic support using a chatbot 24-7 uh, option for people. The methodology was a co-design approach, so lots of people involvement and lots of involvement with people with lived experience, caregivers and mental health professionals. There was a mental health um, professional survey disseminated across the five countries. There was a set of stakeholder focus groups delivered in the different partner countries. There was a set of co-design workshops, including one in Stornoway. And there was the trials and user feedback. So initially there was a short trial for four weeks and there was a longer trial for 12 weeks. And NHS Western Isles led on the trials in Scotland and the trials were done in English and in Scottish Gaelic. Uh, next slide, please, Katie. Just going back to the survey of mental health professionals across the five partner countries, 169 mental health professionals responded. And you can see some of the findings from that here. Um, they quite a high percentage, 65% perceived mental health benefits, so they could see some benefit of having of people having access to a chatbot as an option for support with mental well-being and early stage support with mental health issues. Logistical benefits, so they could see where a chatbot could be developed to support with medication reminders um, or other prompts, perhaps for socialising, exercise, different things like that. 80%, which is quite a high number again, were likely to prescribe a chatbot in the next five years, they felt. And as you'd expect, um, some risks identified that the main concern was that a chatbot is not a real person and that it would not be able to respond to people in crisis. And that although the message was quite clear that the chatbot option probably was not suitable for people in a crisis, there was always a slight risk that somebody might turn to that and expect to be able to get some support from that option. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the summary findings, uh, the positives um, were that people felt having an option for 24 seven would be beneficial to them. They felt that the chatbot was natural and easy to use. They felt that there was a degree of um, privacy, particularly in rural settings where it can be quite difficult to keep uh, your private life private. 
either at times when um, people know uh, if you're visiting a clinic or if a professional is visiting you, what what that person does for a living. And and there's some people want it's less about stigma and more about privacy around people wanting just to have that different options. There were some cost um, efficiencies, obviously around um, travel costs. This wasn't about looking at um, cost efficiencies and staffing. Um, the chatbot would always be seen as an additional and not a replacement. Opportunities for multilingual support. So the chatbot scripts were available in English, in Scottish Gaelic, in Swedish and in Finnish. And uh, chatbot 2 are currently looking at an Irish Gaelic version as well. Uh, creating a Scottish Gaelic version of chatbot is not an easy task i'll tell you that much <laughs> there was a lot of work going to that so if anybody would need any learning around language development for chatbots uh, we probably went through every barrier that there was um and again the the summary was that this was suitable for people at, um at, at early stages and that um there could be some opportunity for people to manage and um not and it'd be less invasive than having a stream of support services that they maybe weren't quite ready for or, or didn't need at that time. Some practical difficulties around the trial were that we found it quite difficult to engage with younger people. Um, for various reasons, uh, they, they didn't feel it was something that they would use or be interested in. Um, and we found some difficulties with recruiting Scottish Gaelic trial participants because there was an expectation um, for people to text back responses and um, culturally there's some difficulties around um, Scottish Gaelic where people speak the language but perhaps are not confident with spelling and grammar and felt that that was added pressure. In fact, some people felt it was like homework. Um, so. Um, we did also get some feedback though that it was nice to have that option and that to be able to express yourself in, in your mother tongue was was useful to some people. Um, again, with the language stuff, lots of difficulties around um, suitable language and translation and agreement on that. And from for utility point, there were a lot of technical bugs to be fixed in the short trial. I think there was over 350 identified and fixed in the short trial before uh, we attempted the long trial. Uh, next slide, please. So the other project that um, I've been working on is the IT for anxiety project and the background around that was the aim was to support the development of blended therapies across the six partner areas in northwest Europe. Again the blended therapies is the mix of face-to-face -face and uh, technological therapies and originally the study focused on research focused on people with PTSD and Alzheimer's disease but this was opened wider uh, post-COVID um, to include people with anxiety and with general anxiety disorder. And the countries involved there were France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Northern Ireland and Scotland. And again, NHS Western Isles were the Scottish partner. Co-creation of innovative solutions was one of the main objectives um, based on the needs of mental health users, families and professionals. So a lot of our work was around the needs analysis a work package to run some focus groups, surveys, different methods of getting that information. There was a work stream on developing the confidence and skills of users and professionals. And there was also a work stream on help to implement better solutions in a sustainable way uh, with a long term package. And there's some work ongoing with that at the moment around a European mental health, um, digital mental health cluster being developed. Uh, next slide, please, Katie. So as I say, the main um, methods were the focus groups, the Imagine Stakeholder Survey, which was sent to over 3,000 participants across Northwest Europe, uh, the Hackathon Solution Development, 
So there were five partner hackathons delivered and NHS Western Isles led on the UK hackathon in June 2022, which was held in Elgin in Murray. There's a list of key stakeholders that we had engaged with, um, people experiencing anxiety, caregivers, mental health professionals were all um, involved in the focus groups. So there was three separate focus groups, uh, one for each um, section of the one group for people experiencing anxiety, one group for caregivers and one group for mental health professionals so that people had a safe space to be able to discuss issues. Um, and around the hackathons, the same groups were involved, but also the startup businesses and digital innovation networks, um, for example, Scottish Government and BCS. <laughs> we plug. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So the UK hackathon, as we say, um, was held at the Alexandra Graham Bell Digital Centre at Murray UHI, which is a fantastic um, resource, a fantastic building to hold an event in. Um, we started off with a UK call out to start up businesses for innovative solutions to support mental health and well-being. So the call went out. There was an application and shortlisting process and six uh, applications were shortlisted at that time. Uh, we had a procurement process to um, secure an external agency to support the event and uh, the Lens Perspectives, which are a, a charity run organisation were successful in that procurement stage and organised and supported us to deliver the event. Uh, we had a panel of four judges, uh, including a person with lived experience, psychiatrist, uh, uh, the head of um, research and innovation at NHS Western Isles, Martin Malcolm, who's my line manager. And we also had somebody from uh, DHI who uh, had a commercial innovation background. Um, and the hackathon event took place oh, a full day. Uh, there were presentations, live pitches from the finalists, and then and that resulted in three winners. Next slide, please. So Kindspace, who you've already heard from, and. I would have been introducing them, but we've gone a wee bit back to front because of my tech, tech problems today. And VR Hive, who are going to speak next, and Kerry and David are with us today. And also Serena, who are in the Next slide, please. And as well as the UK startups that we've been working alongside, we've also been supporting a French startup called Eldom. And Eldom are a company that uh, have created photoluminescent night comfort kits. So these are not uh, digital kits. These are um, physical kits that are placed in uh, residential care homes, hospitals, different um, environments. There's a picture there. I hope you're able to see that where you can see the bed plate um, the bathroom lighting and some strip lighting around the door, which gives off a soft light at night time. So it reduces the need for a uh, hard light. Um, the study was to test the suitability for older adults in care settings in Scotland. Um, the criteria was that the person must be mobile, provide consent and complete the HADS questionnaire with support from staff, so the hospital anxiety and depression scale questionnaire. So that in itself was quite challenging um, due to the nature and um, difficulties that we had with COVID and um, people's health needs and different things that got in the way. We um, fitted the kit and then there was a five week testing period for each resident. Um, staff observed many benefits, including improvement in orientation, autonomy. So that's maybe less using the care bell at night time. Some reduced anxiety in the scores, um, regulation of sleep patterns and reduced falls. 
And one quote from a resident in a Leverborough care home was that she felt more secure, but instantly that it reduces the cost of electricity, which she was very concerned about the cost of electricity in the care home. So that was uh, the reason that she had signed up. So um, it's very interesting. Uh, next slide, please. So see, we tested in 10 Scottish air care homes. Um, originally, the pilot was to take place in the Western Isles only, but as I say, with COVID restrictions and the um, criteria restrictions, we also engaged some care homes in mainland Scotland. Um, we worked with a total of 17 residents. Uh, we had planned for 30, but unfortunately, just it, it was too difficult to reach that number, so we reduced down to 17. Um, you can see from the um, results there that 10 out of the 17 people had lower anxiety score scores at the end of the um, project, which the staff gave some observational data alongside that to say that they felt that it was a di direct result of using the product. Um, three people had no change in their scores. Two people were unable to get full results due to health issues. And two people actually had a higher anxiety score, which on investigation was due to other issues that were, were happening for the person. So the care home actually provided a case study to talk about observational benefits that they had found with the uh, product instead. Uh, the full study report, blogs and testimonies and results are all available on our web page. And there's a little map there to kind of show the spread um, all over Scotland. I, I think we've made the Western Isles look a little bigger than what they actually are. I always think that, but we, we like to do that. So <laughs> I think we're, we're taking up the whole of Scotland there. We don't want to be in a wee box up in the corner. Um, next slide, please. And I'll just quickly talk through this one because just aware of the time. Um, this was the pilot online art therapy service that was funded um, through Empower and it ran um, for eight weeks with eight adults and two trained art therapists. And uh, we had support from the third sector organisations locally around recruiting participants for this uh, pilot and two um, local organisations were involved with that, Alzheimer's Scotland, Western Isles, and Advocacy Western Isles, uh, based in uh, Uist, in South Uist, and Alzheimer's Scotland, based in uh, Lewis. We provided the iPads and set up with Attend Anywhere and um, some art packs and different materials alongside that as well. And again, um, the criteria unfortunately um, excluded people with very complex mental health conditions because this was only an eight week pilot. Um, and normally the art therapy would be a much longer period um, and, and just run in a, in a different kind of way. Uh, next slide, please, Katie. Um, so this just talks a little bit about the, the um, mixed method evaluation around gathering some information around the feasibility of a novel, novel service and the acceptability for us to prevent, present this to, for, for instance, the local psychology team at NHS Western Isles. Marian, um, I think you need to finish up in the next minute. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah. So, um, we, if you, in fact, if you go to the next slide, it'll get, kind of give a summary of it, actually, anyway. It doesn't seem to want the next slide. It doesn't want to go to the next one. Okay. Could that possibly be the last one? Oh, uh, no, no. No, nope, it's not the last one. Um, just quickly go over some of the findings. Um, there were some minor technical issues that we generally quickly resolved. Um, people found really creative solutions for sharing their artwork in the virtual, in the virtual space. Um, the feedback was excellent from all of the clients that took place and that there was a real impact on the well-being um, of, of those people that took part. Um, if you pop to the next slide, Katie. I'm trying, it's not listening. <laughs> it's 
it's my influence i think that's what it is <laughs> Yeah, I think um, this was just really to acknowledge all the different people that have supported us in their networks, um, including yourselves at uh, B BCS, who, who uh, particularly helped us with the hackathon. And then I think the last slide is just our own contact details. Um, if you skip two slides, that will be fine. Um, so this is the link to our web page, which gives more detail on all of these projects. If anybody wants to speak on it over any of the projects, I'm really happy to um, speak to people at another time. That's us. I think we'll, we'll leave it there so that Kerry and David have some time to, to speak because their project is much more interesting to listen to than listening to me. Oh, yours are interesting as well, Marion. I'm so <laughs> of time for questions. Right now, I think no, we'll that's okay. That's Harry and David. Um, have yeah, a if, any, if anyone wants to use the chat, I'll keep an eye on it anyway when, when Kerry and sure. David are speaking. Yeah. So, okay, uh, would you like to introduce Kerry? Marion? Yes, of course. Um, I'm going to introduce Kerry Thornton as a CBR Hive. We're one of our uh, winners at the Hackathon event. Kerry will give a wee bit more detail into her own role and her background and the VR Hive. Um, a great project that we've really enjoyed working with. Uh, over to you, Kerry. Fabulous. Thank you, Marion. And um, just also want to say it was a fabulous presentation from Caroline and Marion as well. Um, I'm going to introduce David to talk as well today. So uh, today me and David are speaking. Um, David is our Chief Operations Officer and I'm obviously one of the project leads for this project specifically. Uh, I'll hand over to David now if he wants to. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the invite to join you today. Uh, it's been a pleasure listening and, con and to be able to contribute. Uh, it's also uh, a pleasure to be coming to you from West Wales. So as a company, we've got uh, uh, Anne Widdop, who's our CEO, who's based up in the west of Scotland. I'm uh, the COO and I'm based down in West Wales. But the vast majority of the team that you can see on the screen there is actually based uh, around Glasgow. And uh, I'm going to take as little time as possible here because the real talent and brains you want to listen to carry. Uh, we're very uh, privileged. Uh, we feel very uh, thankful that companies trust us. We've worked with uh, major brands such as Suntory and Takeda, uh, the NHS, to local partners and major brands such as UWS, Glasgow School of the Arts, uh, University of Edinburgh. And a little bit about us. So we're a company that exists for technology for good. Uh, we're about widening access and solving some of today's, uh, honestly, biggest learning and mental health challenges. Uh, and that for us is everything from the, the UK's uh, mental health crisis when it comes to children, when it comes to things like general anxiety disorder, uh, at getting access to trusted therapeutic responses to some of the challenges that they're facing right the way through to developing AI literacy and trying to take care of our future generation and putting them in a position where they can thrive. Uh, we develop safe, ethical, trusted, immersive journeys. Uh, this is the company line, by the way, just in case I sounds it sounds good um that blur the line between education and entertainment uh we're re really proud at the moment we're about to launch the team has been on a crunch we'll actually be launching now in three weeks a platform called Araseg isle uh which is designed for children aged between 11 and 17 accessed on a desktop of vr where we are uh, introducing ai assisted learning and AI companions to support mental health and general anxiety disorder right the way through to curriculum responses so they can uh, interact with specialists on demand, AI specialists on demand around things like STEM, languages, etc. Uh, in that space, we're also treating the learner, it's a holistic approach to learning, where we are, we have micro games and activities that help them and provide instant support around challenges related to attention, focus, grounding, and so that they can get trusted support when they need it. And that's me, that's the company, and I'm going to hand over to Kerry. Yeah, um, part of that platform that we're launching will have access to Be Mindful, which essentially started out as my master's project that the company partnered with Glasgow School of Art to commission. Um, I created it. And then since then, it has grown from there. 
um, with the great support from IT firm, IT for anxiety from Interreg as well. Um, so basically, yeah, Be Mindful is a virtual reality experience that is designed to elicit awe in users because I found that through research, the more we experience awe, the better it is for us holistically. It just makes us better people. It makes us feel more connected to our environments and it makes our problems seem diminished. So we built the environments to elicit that um, intentionally. And then we've incorporated mindfulness exercises to further engage that sense of being in the present moment, taking in your surroundings and just general calm and anxiety coping mechanisms. Um, so at the moment, uh, it, it's currently been iterated a few different times. Um, I, this video here is our most current iteration of it. So um, we've just, as David mentioned, we've just, we're releasing this platform. This platform is going to be entirely based on the web. So it means that we don't have to install things on hardware. And it means more people then can access it because they don't have that barrier to technology, such as you needing a VR headset to use it. You can actually use this on your desktop as well. Um, basically, uh, when we were designing this, we've done some testing with different groups. When I did this for my master's, I did... Um, I tested whether it elicited all in users and whether people found it as a useful mindfulness experience, whether they experienced the state of mindfulness during the testing. Um, and the next, yeah, I'll, I'll go, I'll get to that slide actually first, because I think that's way more interesting. Yeah, this one here. Um, so basically the, the most important takeaway from this slide here um, is that this was tested on both a high-end affordable device called the Meta Quest 2, which is a virtual reality headset that isn't, um, doesn't use a cable, it's just mobile, and a smartphone VR um, mobile. All of these results are quite comparable, and that was quite a shock to me because as a gamer, I want high-end graphics. I want like the most polished experience with these devices. That's not technically possible. And what was interesting from this experience is that both groups of users accepted this as a mindfulness tool to help with anxiety, um, which, you know, it, as a creator means that we can look at different technologies that don't have that high end, like technological, beautiful, high fidelity. We can look at things that can provide more access to it and that graphics aren't that important when it comes to users' desires for a product like this. Um, but in general, yeah, um, some people didn't have many meditation experience, but they still found that it would be a useful tool to have as well. Um, we also then, since we've developed it for the web version, we've tested with children aged around 11 to 17 in a school in Wales, um, and we just did uh, acceptability testing with them. And they also, across the board, their scores were the only ones of all the products that we tested that went up high in acceptability. So before they just had a blurb to go off what the application was, and they all said, that sounds great. We would like to use that. Um, Afterwards, they use the actual experience and their scores increased in a more positive way. So uh, that was really great for us as well because we had just developed and deployed on the web version. So it was really interesting to see how the kids interacted with the experience. One of the greatest feedback I think we got is that one of the children acted like actually fell asleep while using it. So I feel like he got super relaxed. <laughs> um, but yeah, then after, since then, uh, we have launched with the Barclays Eagle Labs. We had a launch event where we had a bunch of people come try out our product. We were um, had Alzheimer's Scotland. We had a few people from universities, um, people from DHI as well came, and they all found the experience. They all had positive feedback to to give us, which and everybody was very excited to see VR tech being used in this way. And um, so that was a really really great event. Um, we are currently working with Orca at the recommendation of Chris Wright from IT for Anxiety when we had those workshops with him. Basically, Orca um, are trying to, they're basically trying to um, create a standard standard for any app that's in the digital health space so that when you go to a digital health app category in the UK, you can trust that that app has been, has professional assurance and that people recommend using it and they say that it's safe to be used because essentially um there's like 220 odd thousand 
digital health apps on the market and less than 5% of those are evidence-based. So Orca are basically creating a standard to make sure you meet those you know, criteria so that you can be a trusted app by healthcare professionals. And we have done the initial baseline with them and we passed. So we're just working with them to work up to do the, D the DTAC. And then once we've got that, we'll be able to be recommended by uh, Orca to healthcare professionals that they can recommend to their patients. Um, so one of the other interesting things of this project, since we moved to the web version, this is a bit techie, so I'm just gonna nerd out here. Um, we work with the Babylon JS engine, which is an online web-based engine, but this project has like pushed the knowledge that that community has had with developing for WebGL um, and our work actually features in this trailer. Um, so yeah, it's a super like five minute, 15 fame minute, <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, we basically have been helping spread knowledge within the community on how to develop and deploy tools for WebGL. So we're not just trying to benefit and make an impact for people who are struggling with mental health, but we are benef benefiting the technical community overall. Um, if you have questions, feel free to ask. If you want to view our website, you can like scan that thing. That should be fine. <laughs> Amazing, Caroline, very well done uh, and tremendous use of the time. It looks astonishing. It's such a interesting project. You must have had so much fun doing it. Um, uh, Sharon is asking, we we'll only have time for this question. Were you asked to check out the new Apple VR kit? I will I pass that to David. <laughs> <laughs> No, can I just say that we have made contact today, though, and volunteered yeah, the whole team to, to you know, be involved in development. I don't think we'll get a response, but, you know, we have said we're, we're happy to, to assist. Yeah, maybe once they see what you've been doing, they will want to. <laughs> Do we have any other last minute questions? It sounds to me like you've got a tremendous team there, and I do hope you can all stay together and continue to, to develop such fantastic, uh, amazing uh, projects that you can have along. Marion, thank you very much. Marion is on our British Computer Society Health <laughs> and Committee and, and very you. kindly pulled these people in together. Uh, that, to do it, such yeah, that, that they're always great to listen to. Um, you know, I, I always feel a bit embarrassed to refer to them as startups because we're learning so much from oh. them there's there's no startup about it really so exactly. it's just amazing to hear the, yeah. the work progressing for for both well done both and, and honestly such such worthwhile projects caroline tremendous work that you're doing up there uh, and kerry and i'm conscious that we're cross borders we're going everywhere david very kindly been down in wales uh, so a uh, big reach that we've got Folks, if you'd like to get in touch, um, we're on BCS Health and Care Scotland. You'll find the recording soon on the events page of past events. And we hope to bring you something like this again very soon. Um, so watch the space and you'll follow us on Twitter as well. Um, BCS, BCS HCI underscore, underscore Scotland. Uh, and thank you so much to all our speakers, to Marion eventually. <laughs> and by the way, my mother-in-law, spoke Gaelic and every so often she would say computer yeah yeah, yeah we've not we've, they just no, aren't words not, in Gaelic for everything just computer some, yeah right. some things are just best yeah they're best left yeah, best left <laughs> <laughs> so Kerry David Carlin thank you very very much and thank you to BCS for hosting these webinars and Mary for her help in setting up and everything so thanks everyone and good night mm -hmm.